Ladies and gentlemen, Daniel Francisco, who I connected with recently on Twitter, joins us today representing his new project, the Blue Star Union. He is also a former executive director of Project Veritas. Uh, so I, I don't know where we're going to go with this, Daniel, but thank you so much for joining us today. A lot of topics we could get into. I, if there's anything else you want to say in introduction, please feel free. But if you would, I think everybody would appreciate a basic explanation of what Blue Star Union is and your recent billboard that just went up. Adam, it's uh, great here. Great to be here with you. Uh, it's funny, all of the things you've been talking about in the last half hour are word for word the things we've been discussing in our podcast for the last couple of weeks. So it's uncanny between the censorship, uh, between talking about consent, uh, civil rights. I mean, it's a shot for shot of all the topics we've touched uh, in, in the last two weeks or so. Uh, but yes, uh, I, I I worked for Project Veritas for a couple of years. I was part of that movement back in like 2012, 2013. That's where I sort of, I never met you personally, but I've sort of brushed shoulders with you a few times at a couple of events. I've always been an admirer of your work from afar. Um, like I told you, especially when you did that, that cross into DC, that was pretty wild. Um, and it especially resonates for me as someone that lives in New Jersey. And the, the, the two-way movement is probably the, the movement I'm most passionate about. Uh, and I, I'm also involved with a, an organization here in New Jersey called the New Jersey Second Amendment Society that do some great activism work. Uh, but our organization is uh, is born of a couple of funny things. One, I had a kid. And when I had a kid, I stopped caring about what people thought about me. Right. So I, I sort of left the political world uh, eight, 10 years ago. Uh, I went back to the corporate world where I kind of started my career. And I was there for 10 years in this in this malaise where... I can't say anything. If you espouse the wrong opinion, you get in trouble. And I've just watched uh, speech get engirdled at an incremental rate over the years. And now it's it's peaked in a way that is, I mean, if you've worked in the corporate world this year versus even seven years ago, it's night and day. You, you, you can't even compare it. Um, I, I used to joke about being involved. At, I went to Rutgers University. I used to joke about uh, the environment and the way speech is, is uh, restricted on campus. And thinking, oh, you know, this, these are just ideologues. These are just young people. They don't understand. They're actually acting like fascists when they tell me I can't say what I think. And then I slowly grew up and, and went to work. And I thought, oh, well, when I go in the corporate world, that's based on merit. You know, that's based on what, what value I create. Surely people will see uh, the veracity of, of my work and what I do. And, and I just saw that crumble away over the years. And like I said, once, once I got married and had a son and uh, got and got to this point where it, I, I literally saw all the people around me talking and agreeing with me, and none of us could say anything because we all feared for losing our jobs and not being able to pay for our mortgage. Oh, so I, I, I'm I, I, oh, I, oh, I got I got I got to interject here with a couple of things, man. It's funny because I feel like you know since I got out of the Marine Corps, November 30, 2006, you know I don't I, I haven't had a real job. Like I haven't I, I don't know what that's like. I've lived in this world of, no, nope, I'm on the other side of that line. I don't care. You know, and, and I, I really, like, I, I appreciate what that means to have a kid and, and change your attitude, even though I don't have any kids yet. I'm, I'm working on it. I practice as much as I can. But when, <laughs> um, you, when, when you, 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 you do go through a, a bit of a shift in mentality that is critical, I think, for a lot of activists, to come to a place of peace, even if you want to play the political game where your primary concern is, you know, manipulating the opinions of others about you personally, as opposed to the world ideas and being right. Um, I, I, I found a quote today I just want to share from Wayne Dyer. When you become immobilized by what anybody else thinks of you, what you're saying is your opinion of me is more important than my own opinion of myself. And when I first read this, I actually misread it and thought when you become mobilized by what anybody else thinks of you, what you're saying is you're, but you know what? It works the same way. And it really made me think about a lot of the, you know, virtue signaling. And I, I think the term is abuse. Uh, oh, you're just virtue signaling. Well, yeah, I'm trying to tell you that that's wrong and I'm right. Yeah, I'm virtue signaling. <laughs> Darn right I am, you know. But, you know, a lot of the sort of, uh, you know, ego gratification or bolstering-based activism 
you know, or slacktivism or feel good activism or politically correct, or I'm, you know, I'm doing this to make sure that everybody knows I'm a good person kind of virtue signal activism is the same thing is that when you become mobilized by what anybody else thinks of you, what you're saying is your opinion of me is more important than my own opinion of myself. And I hate to make this connection to what we're doing right now as a country, but you look at uh, all of our attention focused to police reform. Well, why are we doing that now? And it's good. It's a lot of good stuff. It's a lot of really good positive reforms that are happening, but why? And, and a lot of it's like, because we've done the work over time to raise attention to these issues. They're coming to a head. They're getting out of the way. They're being dealt with now. But why now? It's so that we don't pay attention to $9 trillion of liquidity added under the coronavirus, blah, 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 blah. All the distractions with that. But to, what, to, to, get, to turn it back to what you're talking about here, Daniel, before you get to explaining Blue Star, I, I want to put you on the spot about some of the language that you use when you you call like you know me about gun rights. You know I'm as absolutist as it comes that it's about property rights. You have the right to own whatever property. You don't need gun rights in the set if you have property rights. Gun rights, and I don't mean to say you don't need them, but to recognize it's a subset of property rights. Your property rights are respected. You have the right to own whatever piece of property, whatever piece of metal, in whatever shape you want. No one can come on your property or invade your person to tell you otherwise, right? And in that sense, uh, I'm I'm really kind of disappointed for all of the people in the gun rights movement or the self defense rights movement who define that cause by the authority of the Second Amendment. Like you don't have your rights because they're, they, they're on paper in the Constitution. You have these rights because they're either natural rights or God-given rights inherent to your, your humanity. Do you have a problem with that term that you use? Do you see that? Or is this, have you thought of this and this is just your best shorthand messaging to call it the 2A movement? Yeah, so like you said, the, the, the rights are, are enshrined on a document, but they're not coming from people, right? They're not coming from an entity or a government, however you want to define it. And I think we're all in agreement with that. Um, are you talking more in terms of the the sort of um, uh, what's the word I'm searching for the semantics of me calling it gun rights? Yeah, or I'm yeah, not yeah. really why, clear. Why, on... do you, do, why do you use that term? You know, I'll I'll be perfectly frank with you, Adam. I, I did not use that like that term consciously with some sort of intent. I maybe it's just something that flows off of off of my tongue as I speak. I mean, it's it's a matter of perspective too. Uh, I mean, if you live in certain parts of the country, there's different meanings to this. In, in New Jersey, where where, where we're from. Um, there, there are no rights here. You know, there, whatever, however you want to define it, it doesn't exist. Um, and if you look back throughout history, the, the, the point that we're trying to highlight is that government in, in, in their evil capacities uses uh, these powers to restrict people. Um, and in, in the past, it's many times been based on the, the lines of race. Um, and it's not just it's not just the Second Amendment or, or, or gun rights. Um, it happens with voting and, and many other things. I mean, after Reconstruction, um, we had literacy tests where you, you can Google this, where people could read double negatives and have to answer these confusing questions that even I might mess up when I'm reading it, you know, and a person with a college education would, would err on some of these questions. Um, they're all just a mechanism for the state to devalue you and, and disarm you as an individual. Um, I mean, in terms of, in terms of New Jersey, uh, I, I, I hate this bores the people that are from here, but I think it bears repeating to your community since it's a national community. New Jersey is without a doubt the most interesting animal when it comes to gun rights. We actually opt out of the federal NIC system. And I'm sure your viewers are aware that anytime you buy a firearm in the United States, you have to go through a point of sale check called National Instant Criminal Check, a NICS check. Uh, in New Jersey, we opt out of that system altogether. And we have a subset, this entire draconian tyranny that our government has instituted that they then use as an excuse to just completely deny us the ability to lawfully acquire a firearm. And of course, and, and I support, and I think it's sort of what you're alluding to, that drives people to then just go find other solutions, right? You know, you have people who can print guns. Uh, it, people in Maryland can can go buy uh, those, uh, there's 80% blocks, right? Which get around to your ability, your need to have to go buy a firearm. So it's like, you can't buy a handgun in Maryland without a permit, but I can go and buy this hunk of metal that's 80% of what the, the uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms says is a gun, and suddenly it's okay. 
Um, and I'm all for that. I believe that every human is sovereign, individual. And if, if you have sovereignty over your life, you must have sovereignty to protect your life. So I, yeah. I'm all on board with that. Um, but in New Jersey, it's, it's disproportionately assessed, right? So I, I happen to also be a councilman in my town. I, I'm in a very small town of about 18, 1900 people. Um, and it's a predominantly right wing, you know, Republican kind of town. And you, everybody knows each other, right? I, uh, another thing about living in a small town that I'm drawn to that I think you're sympathetic to is having a power at a local level where you know everybody. Um, when everybody Absolutely. knows each other, it's hard to be an asshole to people, right? You know, there's there's yes. a sense of accountability. Yes. Yeah, so yes. I walk around my neighborhood and I know everybody. Everybody knows me. If I act like a delirious moron or do something inappropriate. You know, yeah, hold on, Daniel. I got to I got to go back just to make like a note for when we reactivate my presidential campaign talking about localization like it's harder to be an asshole when government is local that, like, <laughs> that could be our slogan no and, I, and obviously I, I wouldn't use that language but to, to to make that point that hey why is government like an asshole well you know it shits on things all the time why well it's easier to be an asshole when you don't have to look at your victim in the face right yeah. and, and when you know everybody when it's at the local level just that inherent personal accountability is transformational yeah i mean even look at policing right uh, i mean what what you you, you were kind of starting to talk about uh the, the minneapolis and, and and floyd you know being killed uh, which is, is tragic and you were saying well why is this conversation happening now right why why suddenly do people care and like right. people like you and me may have been talking about this over beers you know all the time with our friends but yeah. I, I i i have we have a distinct philosophy of why we think that's the case we think that it's because this might be one of the few times where universally people across the spectrum were in agreement, right? You have people that are traditionally on the right and traditionally on the left who, who look at this issue and say, when I see this video, that's just pure evil. I don't see any justification for this act. And I, I, I can see that, I mean, obviously the Floyd situation is terrible, but I've seen, we see videos all day online that are 10% of that. And I still view them as evil as a, as a, an obstruction of justice or an abuse of, of force on behalf of uh, an agent of the state. But this is so clear that I think the system and the media saw this and said, holy shit, before everybody gets on the same side, we need to foment some discord and get everybody fighting again. That's kind of the way we look at it. Um, well, even, but, even, even without that deliberative manipulation, just a distraction, if you go, hey, look, libertarians are calling and, and, and freedom activists all over the world are now calling attention to the fact that we're all getting ripped off with a virus that is, I don't know, let's just say it has a lower fatality rate than trying to spend a counterfeit $20 bill in Minneapolis as the excuse for all of this. And, oh, hey, now, you know what, let's let, you know, how all these police reforms were going to happen anyway, let's let them happen now. And then all the freedom lovers go, hey, let's celebrate and, you know, maximize this opportunity. And now we're not doing the more important thing, but uh, you know, just, just to finish the topic, Daniel, before we move on, there's so many great other things that this this relates to. But the the usage of the language two A of, of recognizing rights as from a document as opposed is is this is this just convenient shorthand or is it uh, is it a is it a is it a rhetorical fight worth fighting and winning to say no? If you're going to talk about rights, talk use accurate language. Yeah, like I, like I said, I'm not purporting to be uh, a semantical expert on, on, on that sort of philosophical discussion. Uh, to me, like I said, I, I see what my eyes show me in, in, in this environment here in New Jersey, and I see the, the way it affects people's lives. Um, I just want to show, see, here, here's the problem in, in this environment. Everybody looks at this issue, and those that are on the right or, or the libertarian-minded, right-wing, Republican, whatever you want to call it, anybody right of center, they attack this from the right, right? And when you're a minority uh, in this environment, in New Jersey, people that think like you and me are a minority. It's just a demographic reality. Um, right. If people flip this on, on its head and attacked from the other side, it would be way easier to demonstrate the abuse that government is doing to us, right? So okay. when, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm with these people in the Second Amendment movement, whatever you wanna call it, they, they'll quote the constitution, they'll quote Supreme Court cases, They'll allude to all of these nerdy kind of white paperish movement, uh, nonprofit type uh, discussions, right? Which are rather intangible and, and, and boring to people. 
Uh, and again, the, demographically, people are not inclined to even think about that. So the way we want to talk about it is like, look, no, this is uh, if, if you really have an issue, as we see all these corporations now uh, jumping on, like you said, why does everyone care? There are, everyone's putting a black square on their Twitter profile. Everyone's banning Aunt Jemima and doing all of these other corporatist gestures that, that don't mean anything. So this, this campaign that we're doing is, uh, was to put up a sign that shows, look, we, 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 think, like, we think what happened was wrong. And look at what our laws here in New Jersey do to us. And by the way, we want to arm black Americans. Uh, it it kind of goes back to the, the censorship point that you were making. Um, when there's bad speech, the reaction of today's modern uh, progressives or leftists is, well, ban the speech, censor it, get rid of it. No, the, the way to combat bad speech is to introduce more speech, right? Is, is to introduce other ideas to flank that, that concept and show why it's wrong and evil. And if you just mask evil, if you hide it, it doesn't go away, it foments, and at, event, at some point it rises and explodes. Um, I mean, look at uh, every, every gun rights movement that there's been in this country, whether you go to the uh, Firearm Act in, I think it was 1968, you know, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X getting shot, JFK getting shot. Now we need a government solution for this problem. 1992, 1993, you got Ruby Ridge, you got Waco, abhorrent, abhorrent acts by the American government. What's the reaction? 1994, we need a, a assault weapons ban. And then what yeah. assault weapons means in New Jersey means something different in California, means something different in Texas. Every jurisdiction is completely different. Um, so we wanted to highlight to the community here, like I said, to a, a national audience and show them that in New Jersey, basically you have to ask permission from the government to even have the ability to get a firearm. And then they have an unlimited amount of time barring you suing the government, which most people, especially poor minorities in urban neighborhoods don't have the money to do, you essentially are disarmed, right? There is no lawful way to acquire a, a weapon, a firearm, even if it's perfectly legal, there's no legal way to acquire it. So of course, people are driven to alternative means of protecting themselves. The problem is everybody wants to talk about inclusion and diversity and all of these, all these companies are putting up the black Twitter square, but do they wanna talk about the sovereignty of the black community? Do they wanna talk about the ability of that community to protect themselves? No, and I think that's the deficiency of the right. They, they catch themselves talking about this constitutional rhetoric, kind of what you're rightfully criticizing me for, instead of looking at it on a practical level and just saying, look, the government is just blatantly disarming you. They're leaving you out there to die. They don't care. And what we put on our sign, which oddly, I thought the biggest controversy from our sign was going to be the idea that we were referring to Black Lives Matters by saying your life matters. It's actually not on the sign that you're seeing in front of you because we were censored. And that's why we have an article up on bluestarunion.com detailing that. The number one you reason- wanted, Hold on, hold on. You wanted, the, you wanted the billboard to say your life matters? So this is what it, it originally said. And if you, if it's also on the website. It said, the police have no legal duty to protect you. Your life matters. Get a gun to protect yourself and your family. Right. Which so it's, it's not even so like I it's not even saying all lives matter in a way to challenge black lives matter at all. It could be entirely it's, it's you, the reader. Exactly. I, right. well, I like love it. we intentionally did not say we, we don't want to get involved with a with a, a particular subset. A gender, gender, not gender, excuse me, uh, group identities and group politics is is cancer. Right. That's what leads eventually to to genocide. We all know that. Um, that's right. not in any way what we're trying to do. However, we do want to highlight that those people, and it's a class issue, those people in urban environments in New Jersey, and if I, if I can indulge you for two minutes, I can explain why that's the case, because it may not make sense. But um, like I said, in New Jersey, in the urban cities, those police departments just don't respond to you, right? So you have to apply for this piece of paper, and then that piece of paper lets you buy guns. And then every time you buy a gun, you have to get another piece of paper. And each one of these waiting periods could be months or years, right? In the urban neighbor, in the urban neighborhoods, because they're police departments, like you said, they're an amorphous, huge organization. It's not the local chief that I know who lives down the street like it is in my town. They have, uh, they will set up rules like, okay, you can come and ask questions about the status of your permit from four to four fifteen on Thursday. And if you happen to be working that day, well, too bad. You just That's you it. can't talk to them, right? And they're they're. They're You're like, disarmed. Well, you, no, you, you are. And that's, and then they're inhumane about it, right? So if you show up at 416 and it's the same person sitting there at the counter who handles and the stack of papers is right in front of them and you go, I, I was late. I just need to get my permit. They'll be like, oh, see you later. Try next week at 415. 
and, and so people give up, right? There's this entire system built where it's discouraging you from even participating. All right. So then what happens? Of course, people are drawn to find alternative methods of protection. They go to the black market or they create their own weapons. And I'm not saying any of these things are bad. I'm just telling you that's the reality of what ends up happening. But at the end of the day, the highest victims of gun crimes and, and violent crimes in New Jersey are in those urban neighborhoods. And we're at the same time telling those communities, hey, go screw yourself. We don't care about your sovereignty. We don't care that you want this gun. Go figure it out on your own and just call the police and we'll figure it out. But at the same time, as, as you all know, call the police. The, yeah, the one Supreme, seconds count. <laughs> not, not only that old adage, but the Supreme Court and District Court in D.C. have all said unequivocally that the police have no legal duty to protect you or offer individualized service. Yep. And so yep. when we when we approached all these major corporations to put up this billboard, I literally have like thousands of dollars I'm trying to give to them. And they're all telling me they won't do it. And why? I thought it would be the line about getting a gun or because it's some implication about the black community. No. Do you want to know what the number one reason Adam was? They didn't want to attack the police. <laughs> Of course, they, they don't want to say that comment about the police having no legal duty to protect you. And they said, that was my opinion. This was their lawyers telling me, that's your opinion. We don't want to put that on a sign. No, and that's course, the government's opinion. Yeah. That's the government. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. No, but so, and, and you know what? I, I get it. And they have the right to decide not to, to participate. But, man, that just shows you. How I mean, this this is kind of a, one of the things that really defines a police state, or at least is, is a major indicator that you live in a police state. And different people define that different ways. And I'm not trying to have an expose on the definition here, but when your country, it, you, when, when police are not servants of the people, but a dominant force of corruption and self-preservation that uses manipulation and bullying and frankly terrorism to control the population that they're supposed to be serving, you have a police state. When people are afraid of something, but they're for their, when major businesses, significant portions of the business community are worried about something as mild as this, as speaking out against the police state, or sorry, against the police, and you can't have their support as you would otherwise to say this, you're living in a police state. This is a state of intimidation to protect the status quo of law enforcement. And this is just an, another shameful reminder. And it's beyond that, Adam. So I, I so like I said, this this organization is is about fighting on these civil rights fronts, right? And I I have people that I know already from you know uh, other organizations that I work with that have come forward. I have a few whistleblowers that are terrified, right? They 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 want to talk about the injustices going on behind closed doors. So for example, without naming the department or mentioning who the person is, there's an individual I know who is a, a, a lawful immigrant to this country and he serves in our armed forces. And he lives here in New Jersey and he's been waiting, he was waiting for four months roughly to get his permit, right? And his chief and his, the, all the power in New Jersey lies with the police department in your locality, right? They are the ones that sign off on your on your permit. The, the, the township, was just ignoring him. So he, I told him, you know, you need to go to your town council meeting and address the police commissioner or address whoever is in charge of the police department in a public setting. And the, the town kept telling him, oh, no, 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 we don't, you know, COVID is going on. Don't come here. Like, we're, we'll, we'll, let, we'll let you know what the chief says, blah, 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 blah. So he posted something on, online and he, and he sent an email. It was like two communications. So what happened? Like four months later, after he's waiting for this permit, he got pulled into the police station. Uh, he got called into the police station and pulled aside and berated by a chief. How dare you speak out against us? How dare you talk you know, using foul language? How dare you say this? How dare you say that? Who do you think you are? Don't you know that there's a virus going on? So they developed these constructs where, well, yeah, you have rights, but now there's all these constructs here that we have an excuse to not honor them, right? It, it's, it's, it's like you said, the right is not coming from a creator. It's not a natural right. It's coming from government. So we'll give it to you when we feel like giving it to you. And if you even ask for a status on it, right? Because they ignore you for months. I, I, I'm not saying this with any hyperbole, Adam. Like people in New Jersey wait years for a shotgun. Like that's, that's not a crazy thing. You cannot just walk into a store and buy a firearm. So there's this entire community of people that are scared uh, that contact us every day. I have another kid who 
I think he had some stupid like marijuana charge or something when he was a minor, right? Not even as an adult, which I don't even think would affect his ability to get a firearm. And he's like in his 20s now. And he's like asking me for advice on what to do because I'm aware, you know, how to deal with these things. And I gave him advice and he's like, yeah, I'm still too scared to go talk to the detective. I need to hire a lawyer. And he's going to spend thousands of dollars to just have a dialogue with the local police department because he's petrified of them. At the end of the day, it's a culture of fear and intimidation. And you're told, you wait your turn. Don't ask, don't ask any questions. Don't ask for a status. And if you interfere, we'll... Well, you'll have negative repercussions. We'll threaten you for even questioning why we're not responding to you fast enough. All right. I got just two more questions for you, Daniel, here. The first one's going to be a hard one sidebar, and then I'll bring it back with a softball for you to wrap up. So, you know, one of the things that is beautiful about what you're talking about is like attacking it from, you know, a different perspective, showing these more universal values, saying it's, it, it's not about these lives are these lives it's your life your life matters and <clears throat> i i know you know the quote if we don't hang together we all hang separately and it, it seems somewhat divisive so i was wondering if if you could say how do these principles apply to what we're seeing right now in seattle with the capitol hill autonomous zone i i heard you talking about that earlier look i don't I don't principally have an issue with what they're doing there. Um, we're seeing what happens when people spontaneously get together and decide to try to coexist and have a society. Now, I, I may have some disagreements with them. I may think they're hypocritical. I think many of the people that are there are espousing that they're doing something. And meanwhile, they're they're asking for like vegan sandwiches and stuff from the outside. And they're, they're asking for food and water. Um, I mean, if they believe in, in the sovereignty of the individuals, I don't see it being acted out. Maybe I'm watching different footage, but I see a guy going in there proselytizing and everybody jumping on him and you know tackling him to the ground. Um, I've seen some some violent acts. Uh, also, at the same time, I, I, I see people that own property there um, and they're shut out from being able to get into their stores and homes. So look, while I principally don't have an issue with the concept of the autonomous zone, I also see other people's rights getting violated uh, as it's yeah. as it's transpiring. So uh, I, I know that's probably not the ideal answer you're looking for, but no, 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 uh, no. It's, it's, it, uh, yeah, if I if I may, it's, it's 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 actually very similar to mine, where you have to say, like I would say I'm barely but decisively you know pro Chaz <laughs> in the sense that I support the heart of what it represents of people saying we're reclaiming a piece of the city of government property for our community and saying police aren't welcome and the rest of the U.S. government's not welcome. <clears throat> I think that's great. Even your analysis, though, it, you know, and, and, and it sounds like you've come to roughly the same position. And, and I, I, it's, I really hate the way the conversation is happening around this where people go, well, they did this one bad thing, so their whole project's illegitimate. And you're like, really? But, even, Daniel, even the things that you point out, like the incident with the preacher, you know, how many people were involved in harassing him? You know, half a dozen, a dozen. How many people are involved in the chat? Hundreds, thousands, you know? And so, so like, it would be the same way to someone to, to, to look at the United States, uh, you know, or, uh, of America and say, well, do you see how many people they lock up? It, the whole nation must be shit, you know? Or to even judge the gun rights community. Well, did you know that most suicides in America are committed by handgun? Yeah, I don't think gun rights are a good idea. I don't think the gun rights community are good people. You know, like it's that kind of just cherry picking judgment that I think is, is really disgusting by the mainstream media and most people in the freedom community in general looking at the Chaz, not being able to separate, you know, yeah, small businesses in there who are about being denied access. That's a problem. Rape, duh, that's a problem. Theft, duh, that's a problem. Now, is it theft of government-owned property, then that's not a problem because those are taxpayers taking back what's been stolen from them as long as it's like a reason they're not trying to take back. Anyway, I think it's it's really critical and, and I'm glad that you at least have that same kind of nuanced position. And, and the other thing is you can disagree with people on everything and still praise them for doing one thing powerfully and beautifully correct. And I, and I think it's it, it would be great if the 
two way community, and I use it deliberately there, the people who say it that way <laughs> could, could really recognize that there's this one righteous thing here and that, you know, you, you, we have to be able to say, I, I might disagree with what you say, but I will fight to the death for your right to say it. Same thing politically. I might disagree with how you're going to politically organize, but if you're doing it without forcing it on your neighbors, I want you to have that right. So finally, and maybe you can connect these ideas, Daniel, I want to, I want to read your mission statement for bluestarunion.com. And uh, I don't know if you want to bring up anything. I think it's a pretty, you know, your two big resume points. You've kind of like, I like how you really like downplayed that in this interview. Yet uh, I'm also a councilman. Uh, hello. Most, most jerks who sit on city councils go, hi, I'm councilman Francisco. Not, oh yeah, by the way, I'm a councilman, right? And, and that you were, you know, former executive director of Project Veritas. Pretty big resume checkpoint. So if you wanted to say anything about those, feel free. But uh, I want to give you a chance at least to, to wrap up with bluestarunion.com as your website. Mission statement under who we are says to educate the public about how to exercise their civil rights, engage with public officials, and build strong communities through media campaigns, publicly accessible programming, and community events. You're starting with a, a fun billboard project that's already got some beautiful controversy built into it. In the fulfillment of your mission, what's next? How can people get involved? What, what do you want people to do to, to, to help you with this? Yeah, and that, that underplaying is not completely unintentional. I've already gotten yelled at uh, by locals uh, in government saying, oh, you can't be doing this. You can't be saying these things. And, and yet we, we persist. Um, so, yes, you know, this, this is intended to be, uh, at the end of the day, a sort of fraternity. And when I say that, I don't mean men. I mean humans, you know, getting together and having dialogues about things in a way that people normally don't talk about. Um, the the o overarching theme that people don't realize is at the end of the day, and you say this all the time, Adam, most people are good, right? And, at, and government sits there, whether it's in your public schools, whether it's in the interactions you have in, in the corporate world with uh, required uh, uh, sensitivity training, everything that government does to us trains us to be distrustful of other people. And I'm, I'm so opposed to that in the most strictest sense. Um, most people are good. Most neighbors are not going to harm you. And uh, this concept that like if somebody has a 50% disagreement with you that they're not a civil person and you can't have a dialogue with them is crazy. If you were to talk to somebody who is an ardent Bernie Sanders supporter and someone who is a, a Trump supporter, outside of monetary policy and fiscal policy, you, they have quite a congruent you know, overlap, right? They might actually see eye to eye on a lot of things. So the point of this organization is to sort of be the antithesis of like the typical like neocon Ben Shapiro types where it's like, Oh, gotcha. You got owned thug life. And then stupid sunglasses showing up on the screen. Like I, I honestly, man, that's like one of the things I hate more than anything. We, we, we want this to be a fraternity where people who have all stripes respect each other as individuals, but can get together and have real dialogue. And then us as the organization, we want to crowdsource donations from our members to engage in fun public stunts like this billboard to expose the hypocrisy of statism. And, and that at the end of the day is what we'd like to do. We'd like to change the world here in a way where we bring people together instead of trying to highlight how we're different and fomenting distrust. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Daniel, for joining us today, ladies and gentlemen. BlueStarUnion.com.